Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Murphy. I'm the director of the Center for Innovative Pedagogy and I am uh, just thrilled to invite, uh, to introduce Brian, Dr. Brian Alexander uh, today. Uh, Brian is an internationally known award-winning futurist scholar, consultant, and teacher focused on the future of higher education. And he's been a longtime friend of Kenyon's, dating back to the early 2000s uh, with his work through Knightley, the National Institute uh, uh, for Technology and Liberal Education, and now as an independent scholar. Um, and a great friend and teacher to me personally. Uh, every time I introduce Brian, I try to say something nice enough to really embarrass him. And this time, what I'm going to say is uh, we, CIP has done a lot of online work over the last two years. Uh, and if you've thought it was good, there's about, I estimate that there's about 40% of it that I learned watching Brian. So thank you, Brian, for that. Um, uh, and we uh, appreciate you. This is, I believe, Brian's fourth visit to Kenyon. Um, and uh, today he will be uh, discussing his upcoming book, uh, Universities on Fire, which looks at uh, the way that anthropogenic climate change is going to impact higher education structures. And Brian, with that, thank you, welcome, and I will turn it over to you. Oh, that is enormously kind. Um, I, I have to say thank you so much, uh, both for the opportunity uh, to reconnect with uh, this wonderful campus and its population. And also thank you for the very, very kind introduction. Uh, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, although I, I now uh, no longer eat meat, um, Joe is a fantastic cook uh, and cooks a, 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 a very, very mean fried chicken. Um, uh, and he has a wonderful family. Uh, greetings everybody from uh, a very bizarre time. Uh, I'm, I'm talking to you now from uh, just outside Washington, D.C., uh, where uh, for the past month I've been teaching a class virtually, and tomorrow I get to metro into campus and uh, meet my students for the first time in person. Um, all kinds of things are happening, um, and uh, what I'd like to do with all of these thoughts is to focus them now on one particular area. Uh, I'd like to, oh, uh, Joe, can you uh, give me the uh, uh, co-hosting so I can share my screen. Yes, of course. Thank you. Sorry about that. Oh, I should have asked. I should have asked. And uh, I'm really glad to hear that you have the uh, uh, transcript uh, being generated. That's excellent. Um, I have a slab of PowerPoint, and uh, you are the first uh, to be uh, the victims of it. Uh, and so I I'm very, very serious about wanting to hear your thoughts uh, as we go. Um, this is... Uh, and my thoughts at the end, we'll have plenty of time for conversation, for questions and video and audio. Uh, but along the way, I would love to hear from you in the chat box. Uh, so please feel free to toss in your ideas. This is gonna cover a huge topic. Uh, so I can also just go back to any particular point and zero in on it. Uh, this is the uh, uh, an outline of my book, which my publisher is chewing on uh, with a great deal of relish, apparently. Um, it's called Universities on Fire. And it takes a look at how higher education might intersect uh, with the climate crisis over the next 80 years. Uh, I'd like to put to you the possibility that the climate crisis may be the biggest challenge facing higher education worldwide. What you're looking at here is just a small sample of it. Uh, this is a weather station off the Atlantic coast in Massachusetts, and the U.S. Weather Service recently abandoned it. Uh, you can see the Atlantic Ocean to the left, uh, already chewing up the ground underneath the station. So rather than uh, building up the seawall or relocating it, they just decided to give it to the waves. Um, this has already happened. We are wading literally and figuratively into the first parts of the climate crisis now. Uh, I'm speaking as a futurist, and I, I should do a little throat clearing in order to explain my approach here. Uh, this is one of my favorite memes uh, about people's jobs. Um, and as a futurist, my job is to look ahead to what may come next and to help people think more strategically, more creatively about it. And uh, for years, I've been working in the future of higher education in a very broad sense. And now I'm zeroing in on this one particular topic. Uh, along the way, I make a lot of media. I hold a lot of projects. Uh, I do an online book club. I do a weekly uh, forum where we talk about the future of higher education. Our 60th anniversary is next week, matter of fact. Uh, I write books. 
and uh, I also publish a monthly trends analysis, all of which for years uh, have let me do deep research into how higher education is changing, covering a lot of ground. What I'd like to do today is to walk you through some of the intersections I see between the climate crisis and higher education. Uh, and I, to set this up, we're going to begin by talking about the physical campus, what happens to the grounds, the buildings, the population. Then we're going to shift to looking at the research enterprise and how that might change. And then over to teaching and learning, including curriculum, and then to community relations, which I just had the pleasure of talking with one Kenyan class a few minutes ago. Uh, and then over to academia in the broader world uh, with a quick conclusion about what we might do next. Now, a couple of uh, caveats here. Um, I'm going to rule out explaining climate change because we don't have the time. And I assume all of you have a baseline familiarity, if not professional expertise. And uh, we also don't have the time. Um, I'm happy to hear from people if they'd like to zoom in on a particular aspect uh, from their professional expertise. This is also largely a macro picture. I'm talking about overall uh, global higher education and how it can be impacted. There's lots and lots of room for variations in time and space. This is also a long-term trend, uh, and talking about this is actually a problem. Uh, trying to imagine how the climate crisis can play out for generations. That's not often the way we think about higher education. Now, we're going to focus on global higher ed, not just the US, but uh, the roughly 20,000 colleges and universities around the planet, which have a wide range of exposure to the climate crisis. I'd like to, as we go today, to zero in on the liberal arts aspect. Now, that's a particularly American uh, view, uh, mostly, uh, but I'd like to hear your thoughts about the perspective that comes from that unique sector. And also for our timeline, we're going to be looking at roughly the next 80 years, uh, so about two generations to come. Now, one of the problems of talking about the climate crisis is that while we have an awful lot of data, an awful lot of models, there is a wide range of uncertainty. And just at the biggest possible aspect, let me just introduce three possible scenarios. Um, the good, the bad, and what we'll probably have to deal with. Uh, the good scenario is what the uh, IPCC calls SSP 1-1.9. They don't have a very good nomenclature yet. Uh, and this is the idea that uh, over the next, say, 80 years, humanity takes the climate crisis very seriously. We actually organize, we transition away from fossil fuels, we do all the things, and we don't pass any tipping point. Now, the tipping points are these uh, huge changes where once they start, they accelerate and get very fast and have all kinds of impact, such as uh, having a massive ice sheet, either from Antarctica or Greenland, uh, or Greenland uh, tip over into the sea. Uh, I'm going to assume that those don't happen in this scenario and that any disasters that do occur are benevolent. Uh, for example, um, and this is a benevolent with, with quotes from it, really, uh, a volcanic eruption actually cools the earth to a degree. Uh, so that can help retard some of the worst aspects of climate change. Now, the other scenario, the more extreme one, um, is SSP 5-8.5. And this is where humanity basically gives up uh, and climate change accelerates and gets very, very bad. This is where the global temperature increases by five to eight degrees by the year 2100. Uh, and this is where parts of the world are rendered uninhabitable. Human civilization is in a continuous crisis mode. Uh, and how we actually live uh, may be in a state of perpetual refugeedom. Uh, this is the worst case scenario. That's one to bear in mind. That's the bad. The one that I'm working with, that I'm assuming for today's talk, uh, is a kind of middle path. That the temperature rises by about two degrees by 2100. So we have some sea level rise. We have some aridification, some desertification. Uh, we get our act together to some degree, and otherwise we don't. Uh, so we have some collective action that's interesting and productive and in some ways we fail, uh, and that we pass one or two tipping points. Uh, I mentioned the ice sheets before. We can also think about the great transatlantic conveyor slowing down or stopping. Uh, so this is a world of a great deal of danger, a great deal of challenge, and this is more or less our happy medium. Now, when higher education confronts this, it, it almost seems too big to think about. Uh, the climate crisis itself is such a large and daunting idea that we often think about it as a hyper object. 
uh, one that's really difficult to parse and to get our arms around. And higher education itself is an extremely diverse and varied ecosystem, uh, just in one country, much less in the whole world. But to bring these two together is necessary. First, I think we will respond uh, in terms of our perception of physical risks. So to what extent the campus is literally in danger of flooding, of fire, of storm, of uh, aridification. And then secondly, we'll look at the secondary impacts. So what happens when there are, when climate change begins to be felt and there are secondary effects in nature or the economy? So we think, for example, what happens if parts of Florida become uninhabitable uh, and how that changes uh, the local ecosystem or what it does to the local economy? And then the third is taking a look at the human civilizational responses, uh, socially, culturally, politically, and how we take steps in order to respond to this crisis. So those are three kind of large domains of change. Higher education's response occurs in two places. We either take protective action right away. Uh, so we do things like set up cooling shelters for when it's too hot. And then we also take steps that are not about our immediate protection and safety, that are part of participation in the global stage. Uh, so we, for example, decide to supply our own electrical power in a given campus. And that might not change the world, but it represents part of our commitment to the broader electrification of the world. Let's start on campus. Uh, physical campuses, depending on where they are in the world, are subject to all kinds of threats. This is a projection of what might happen to the coastlines of North America uh, if sea level rise is significant. And I think if you run your eyes around parts of the coasts, you'd be really struck. If you look at San Francisco, for example, uh, and see there's now an inland sea. Uh, so you think what that does to institutions uh, in the California State University system. Um, you take a look at Baja California, uh, how the Sea of Cortez is now further up and it actually ends up east of Los Angeles. Look at the East Coast and see from Halifax to Charleston, uh, how much of the coastline is now underwater. And if you look especially at the Northeast, you think of just how many institutions are there in New England. You look at New York, you look at the Mid-Atlantic. And then the Southeast is where the real damage is. Florida is simply underwater completely here. Uh, the Mississippi has grown into an inland sea. And you can see from Houston to Veracruz, the shore of Mexico is nibbled away. Um, and Cancun is long gone. Think about all these areas. This is just confronting just the specter of rising water. So that physical threat leads us to different responses. And Matthew and Orchid and your classmates, and we just talked about this very briefly, we're already still, we're already seeing some of these changes start to happen. The Florida Keys pictured here, uh, already the state of Florida has made crucial decisions about which keys, these little micro islands, they will maintain. That is, they will try to raise up the key surface by adding soil to it or elevating buildings. And which of the keys they're going to abandon. So they've already made those decisions. Uh, for right or for wrong, I'm not going to judge the ethics or politics here. I'm just going to point out that the state of Florida has already written off part of it uh, to rising seas. Now, if we look at the more densely populated Miami-Dade County, you can see that this is an area that is definitely, definitely in the crosshairs of the worst of the climate crisis. Uh, already, it's subject to daylight flooding. Uh, every hurricane rushes through this. What you're looking at here is a plan from the U.S. Corps of Engineers on how to not fully protect, but just to do a good job of trying to protect Miami-Dade. They offered an initial plan, which the uh, county determined was too expensive and too ugly. So the Corps of Engineers came up with this instead. Uh, and this is something which will have a wide range of impact. But let's look at what this means for higher ed. Here are some of the institutions in Miami-Dade. Uh, and you can see a pretty wide range, University of Miami International, Florida National University College, another University of Miami campus. And you can see they're all within a mile of the shoreline. And this is where the water surges course right through. And in fact, let's go right to the sea level. Let's go right to the sea edge. Brown Mackey College, Miami, Miami-Dade College, Wolfson campus. These are literally on the beach. So you think about what these campus leaders have to consider if they look ahead a few years, much less 50 years, 
Will they have to armor themselves? That is, build elaborate seawalls. Will they make their buildings float? There are already some interesting experiments with floating buildings right now. Will they have to elevate the campus uh, using a mixture of soil, concrete, and stilts to raise themselves up so the water can rush underneath them? Um, or will they just move and migrate their campuses to drier land? Now, this is the most extreme case in the United States, but it is definitely not alone. Uh, and definitely not alone in the world. Uh, if you look at uh, the coast of India, for example, in Bangladesh, there are many universities within an hour of the sea, and that's a sea that rises and floods with a great amount of power. What you're looking at here is an interesting story. This is the National University of Jakarta uh, in, the, in, in the Indonesian islands, uh, and it's in Jakarta, which has turned out to be a mistake. Jakarta is a bit like Miami. It is at sea level. It floods easily and is in such danger right now uh, that the national capital moved this past year away from Jakarta to a safer location. So you think about a campus like this and wonder what kind of planning they have to do, what kind of preparation as the South Pacific chews at their very livelihood. This is a campus that matters a bit to me. Um, this is in the Lake District of uh, England. I uh, did my dissertation on the romantics and uh, romantic poetry, and this is some of the beloved area there. And this is a huge selling point for that university, this gorgeous, gorgeous part of nature. What happens when the temperature rises two degrees? What happens when this is racked by storms? And all of this changes. The trees cannot live any longer at those locations. The grasses change. Other plants change. The lakes, the ponds become uninhabitable or unlivable and silt up or become covered with algae? Do they have to undertake a massive, massive effort to try to preserve this? Or do they have to grapple the fact that this whole area is mutating and changing and what that means for their brand, for their identity, for the very selfhood of this campus? Now, those are some of the extreme cases and there are many others. Uh, Pacific Union College in, in California, for example, gets hit with a big firestorm every couple of years. So they have elaborate plans right now, including their own airport and partnerships with EMTs and clear cutting in order to preserve their institution. Um, if we think about these campuses, how this plays out, it, it occurs in several different areas. You think about campus buildings. We were just talking about this uh, new library, which I can't wait to see. Uh, think about when you build a new residence hall, a new lab building, a new administrative building, a new arena, how now we must think if they will be a carbon zero or carbon negative building. That is, most buildings right now are carbon positive. Their lifespan, they emit CO2, both in their construction process you think about making girders and then shipping them across the country. You think about as well uh, all the materials, concrete and cement take a lot of CO2. They're housed in their very fabric uh, and in their own operation. They need lights, they need heat, they need air conditioning, they need all the laptops to be powered up and all of this. So they emit carbon dioxide. So they, in a small way, contribute to the climate crisis. So what do we do instead? When we build a new building and renovate an old one, do we try and make it a carbon zero building so that there is a net wash, there's no new CO2 emitted in the course of its construction? We have a lot of codes on how to do this. We have a lot of architectural schools of thought. We have all kinds of manuals. We know how to do this. Uh, it's expensive and it takes a lot of will to do this. Um, I can't think of the name of the building uh, that I was virtually in today, but think about buildings which are very old have a lot of local character, have a uh, Matthew, what's the name of it again, please? Ascension Hall. Ascension Hall, thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, they have a lot of character, maybe a historical registry. They, uh, how do you change them? You know, is this, or preserving them? Do, does preserving them in the era of the climate emergency represent another tax paid uh, to maintain them? Uh, think as well about how different campuses may or may not have the resources to do this. Uh, an institution like, say, Stanford or Williams College uh, is just, you know, saturated with funds. But what happens to many state universities? What happens to universities running low on students? Uh, do they have the ability to do this? You could go further still uh, and try to make a, a building that's carbon negative. So you design it so that as a whole, it actually 
reduces some CO2. There are a lot of ways of doing this. And I'll show you some uh, coming up. One is to make it literally greener, to have a lot of green life built onto it. But we also have carbon uh, direct capture technologies that suck carbon out of the atmosphere. It may be that the goal won't be just to be carbon neutral, but to be carbon negative. We can also think about new buildings, new kinds of fiber, new kinds of material that can be used, and some old ones, uh, using more wood, for example. Uh, in fact, in uh, ancient Persia, there was some interesting cooling uh, architectural uh, designs uh, called wind traps that we may not get to emulate. And perhaps, perhaps campuses will become the testing grounds, uh, the labs for experimental practices, such as demountable buildings, when you can basically assemble a new building partially out of pieces of old ones. I mean, the architecture, the physical look and feel of our campuses is likely to change. We'd also think about more protection. Uh, so I mentioned before barriers against water. Um, so think about, say, um, if you're in downtown New York City, uh, there's a lot of talk after hurricane, uh, the hurricane that clobbered them uh, badly last time, should you build a large wall or a barrier structure against it? Um, we know how to do that. It's expensive as heck, it takes time, but should that be done? Well, should a campus like Columbia or NYU or any of the uh, CUNY schools or any of the SUNY schools in the metropolitan region, how should they participate? Should they, for example, just hope to be included? Uh, if there isn't such a barrier, should they consider building one for themselves? And if there is such a big project going on, uh, we're talking about some huge projects in, in Boston right now, can a college or university contribute? Uh, can students, for example, do work study on the construction or maintenance of such a site? Can the researchers contribute their brand new research to making sure it works? And this is just for water. We also have to think about desertification. Uh, something like 40% of the land area of the world is arid, uh, is very, very dry. And that region, that amount is likely to increase. So what happens to campuses that are on the edge of deserts or very dry lands? Think about the camp California State University system schools around the Mojave. Think about the universities in Egypt that are right on the Sahara. Uh, how do they protect themselves from rising deserts? I mentioned elevating buildings. The US Naval Academy is already planning on doing this uh, because they are appropriately located right on the water. Uh, so they're talking about basically putting buildings on stilts. Um, or do we move? I mean, these are some of the, just the physical and immediate considerations. We can think as well about our electrical power. I mean, some have said, if you wanna sum up what can humanity do to try to address the climate crisis, the biggest step we can do is to stop burning fossil fuels and power ourselves from alternative sources. Well, what do campuses do? Overwhelmingly, campuses outsource their power supply. University of Texas, Austin actually has their own on-campus power supply, and that's pretty unusual. Um, but maybe we will start outsourcing in a different way. So instead of outsourcing to uh, a utility that produces power through coal or oil or gas, instead we'll try to emphasize utilities that produce them through renewables through hydro or through uh, uh, solar uh, or through wind. In fact, Berea College in Kentucky recently did this. They helped build two new hydro plants or renovate them and off campus, but nearby. So they can now draw electricity from that renewable source. Or do we start doing more on-campus installations? Do we start, for example, putting up solar panels? And the solar panels can be on top of buildings. They could be freestanding racks, as I've seen in Middlebury College. Uh, do we put them on top of car structures? Do we put them on top of vehicles? Uh, how do we, you know, do we try, do we add instead uh, wind turbines? Uh, or if we have access to water, do we put in low head or high head hydro? I mean, how much should campuses build? in order to source materials locally. And again, that can become, especially in the liberal arts tradition, a very campus community-oriented project where you can have students involved in the work, you can have faculty involved in the work in design and so on. And again, research and design, research universities across the world are right now working on how to build better wind turbines, how to build more effective storage of power batteries. To what extent do we be does that become part of, say, undergraduate research at a liberal arts college? Hang on one second. And other aspects of the physical campus come to mind. Food, for example. Uh, we think about how it's pretty well known that the human food system contributes significantly to the climate crisis. That is, uh, 
our reliance on animals, both for meat and for plant-based products, generates methane. Uh, methane is not as long lived in the atmosphere as CO2, but it's far more powerful. Uh, and we generate a lot of that through beef uh, and dairy cows, but we also generate CO2 in the way that we ship so much food worldwide. Should we reconsider our diets? That's a subject of global debate right now. Well, should campuses do this? Should our food services rethink what they offer? I don't just mean having a vegetarian option. I mean mandating this or encouraging it, perhaps through incentives, perhaps through deals, perhaps just through making sure people have more and more vegetarian choices and fewer and fewer meat-based choices. Uh, think about the green spaces on campus as well. Uh, you have a whole set of, of lovely lawns and a lot of great trees on campus. A lot of campuses try to make that a key part of uh, the quad. Um, in fact, uh, my alma mater, University of Michigan, had these huge, huge lawns. Uh, those are all lovely things that we associate. Well, lawns are expensive uh, to maintain. They use a lot of fertilizer. They require maintenance time. They also require water. And it may be that as water shortages become an issue, that holding out a lawn will seem like an act of privilege. And in fact, those spaces could be better used uh, at, for other purposes, such as growing food or holding wind turbines or holding solar panels. Again, the look and feel over campus can change. On top of this, we have a lot of transportation. And when I visited Kenya, I drove in or was driven in in a car or a van. Well, these are all about burning fossil fuels. So does a campus decide, for example, to switch its fleet, its vans, its cars, its shuttles, its buses off of fossil fuels and towards hybrid and then towards electric? Sure, this is something some are doing right now. Do we decide to try to disincentivize people from driving on our campuses with these vehicles? So for example, having more and more electrical power stations and perhaps fewer parking lots. Perhaps we try to narrow some of the roads or do we experiment with making some of the roads solar cells? There are projects we're doing this right now. Um, do we decide to push against having so many cars? Do we ban cars ultimately? Again, I'm talking about next week, but I'm also talking about the next 80 years. Do fossil fuel burning cars become as horrific to our imagination and our mentality as say, smoking a cigar and giving someone secondhand smoke without their consent? Or does it seem even worse still? Now we can green up our campuses in all kinds of ways. This is a wonderful uh, apartment building in Milan. And you can see that they've covered every single floor they can with lots and lots of plants growing. Now this is not easy to do. Uh, both you know, to maintain plants is never trivial, of course, uh, but also the higher up a building goes, the harder it is for a plant to survive, uh, if they, especially if they're designed for the ground. Um, and also there are water issues here, but think about the way this looks. Think about how the psychological benefit occurs of having so much greenery uh, within the space, but also it cools the space. So it reduces the need for so much air conditioning uh, and also can provide food. So again, we have that you know, carbon neutral or that carbon negative point of view. There are many possibilities like this just looking at the campus environment. Oops. Uh, before I get into a contentious issue, let me just quickly ask for, uh, for your sense, am I going too quickly, too slow, or am I just in the Goldilocks zone? You can say something out loud or, or use the chat if you like. Thank you, Cheryl. I just have this, this great fear that every person does in a virtual environment, which is, oh my God, was I muted that entire time? Um, I have to be careful. Right. Uh, thanks, Bonnie. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks, Ray. Okay. Speaking of transportation, academics use transportation in another way. Our staff and some of our students and a lot of our faculty travel to professional events, to conferences, to presentations, to do research. Should we do less of this? Uh, Sweden has already given us fliegskum, uh, flight shaming, the idea that uh, if, if you think eating meat is bad or driving cars is bad, flying in a jumbo jet is especially horrible. Uh, f jet fuel is a powerful contributor to CO2 and we burn a lot of it. So the idea is that we should travel less. Um, now, should academics do this? Should we go to fewer conferences? Should we uh, do more and more of our work virtually? We already know how to do that. Um, we have, uh, we know thanks to COVID 
uh, how to do webinars well. Uh, Joe there in his session in the center are, of course, are powerful experts in this. Um, we also know how to do high flex meetings. Uh, so we can have uh, that combination of face-to-face -face and, and online at the same time. It may be that is where our research environment is headed. Um, that's a way to reduce our CO2 emissions. And there, there are conferences which have been doing this for several years. Um, what you're seeing here, by the way, is one of my fun uh, uh, models for uh, a hybrid environment. Um, you can see what looks like a segue with an iPad on a stick on the top. Um, there are a few different robots like this, basically it's a telepresence robot, uh, where someone can Skype in, in effect, uh, to a meeting and drive this little robot around. Uh, there's a friend of mine, you can see him in my face there in the little iPad. Um, but why not do this? There are a lot of reasons not to do this. Uh, one is that uh, not everybody will have access to that kind of virtual work. Uh, some of them may just not have the time or the money. Uh, some of them might not have the bandwidth, literally the bandwidth for this. Um, plus, we have the issue that some people professionally are better suited for this. I don't mean temperamentally. I mean their careers. Uh, a new person, new in their field, benefits greatly by being immersed uh, in a conference for the first time, or being able to go to an archive or a lab for the first time. Uh, later on, people in their careers have the ability to, you know, they know the ground, they know the terrain, they can interact more effectively uh, at distance. Plus, there is other resistance. Uh, a lot of faculty and staff see these as legitimate perks. Uh, they see that the, the hallway environment can't be replicated online. They believe that the face-to-face -face is just much richer. And they have friends. They have close colleagues. Uh, their conversations which occur, which they don't think can be replicated online. So we may not do this. We may continue to fly in the face of flight shaming. The question is how long? Um, I'm happy to talk about flying and CO2, by the way. Right now, there are experiments in electric planes and uh, well, alternative fuels, but the experts are now are at least 20 years out from that. Now, all of that is the physical campus. All of that considers uh, what we have uh, for the face-to-face -face physical environment or buildings. We can turn to a few other issues. Uh, one is research. Uh, academic research is crucial, of course, uh, and there are a lot of ways that this impacts us. First of all, um, almost every discipline gets a chance to research the climate crisis in all kinds of ways. Obviously, STEM fields play a major role. And it's not necessarily that obvious. When you think about it, like earth science, of course, environmental studies, obviously. We have at least one chemist here who has so much to tell us about CO2 and methane. We also have physics, we have hydrology and so on, and field after field. Engineering, think about civil engineering as a major boom field, uh, as that is a field which can add you know, these earth, these walls against the sea we built. But also the social sciences step in, or we think about political science, for example. What kind of political organization will we evolve in order to deal with this? What happens in economics? Uh, already economists are trying to figure out how we price climate change. What kind of financial models are there for mitigation? Psychology is already looking at climate grief and what it means to experience having your world change around you. And the arts and the humanities which seem as far away from the sciences as possible, have lots to contribute. They have ways of envisioning uh, past and present climate change. Let me just give you two quick examples. Um, here on the left, this is a fascinating visualization project. Uh, the idea is to try to get us to imagine how global heating can play out. And the idea here is to pick a physical site and imagine that it has been physically moved south. So think about, for example, um, how Washington DC might feel like this part of Arkansas, uh, given a certain degree of in increase, or Washington DC may feel like this part of Mississippi. Uh, these are clever visualizations that help us think through. Or think about here, um, the current Pope issued a major encyclical letter uh, concerning climate change. Uh, so religion plays a huge role in this. Basically every academic field is summoned by climate change and can do its research. Now, this can also lead to fields expanding. So obviously a field like civil engineering or earth science is likely to grow in terms of enrollment, in terms of the number of faculty involved. And some may contract as the crisis deepens, depending on where you are. 
So if you're in a nation that's very committed to climate change and your campus is very committed to it, it may be if your academic field does not commit to it very well, that it may contract. You'll just have fewer faculty, fewer students, less money involved. But we could also see new domains and new disciplines appear. So think, for example, about geoengineering ethics as a field. Uh, think about uh, what discoveries will yield in terms of new disciplines that pop out. We know that R&D, we know that social change has produced new academic forms, so we should anticipate those. And also inter and transdisciplinarity, because so much of this work requires that. So to think, for example, about what happens to Las Vegas, and higher education in Las Vegas you know, with climate change, uh, with global heating. What happens to the, to the campuses there? Well, we can think among other things about this in terms of meteorology. We can think about in terms of hydrology, but also in terms of urban planning, as well as about academic design and so on. Field after field gets put into play. And then we also have the issue of politics that occur within institutions. So think, for example, about students who want to end having a faculty member who is a petroleum geologist because they are helping make the crisis worse. Think about students, faculty and staff demanding more chairs in climate justice. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of tension on different campuses. If you think about the 1960s, that might be a mild form. Think perhaps more of the 1930s. And then supporting this research becomes more and more challenging. Uh, for example, if you think about sites, research sites that are physically endangered, think about archives or labs that are on the edge of a desert or on the edge of the sea. A lot of libraries in Boston, a lot of museums in Washington, D.C. Think as well about research sites, physical sites, uh, if you're trying to do work on an underwater location, trying to track sea, uh, sea life. As that heats up, that changes radically and quickly. How does a campus support that kind of research? When do we decide that we have to deal with digital emulations of that kind of research? Plus, we have external political pressures of all kinds. I know it's obvious to say, but it plays out in different ways. And I'll get back to those in a bit. Now, Kenyon College, like liberal arts colleges everywhere, is passionately devoted to teaching and learning. So let me just quickly dive into this. I'm happy to circle back, so I'm sure you'll have ideas about this. First of all, what happens to our curriculum uh, as the climate crisis worsens? It's possible that it will change and reflect research so that we'll have more and more classes on civil engineering, for example. Um, it's also possible that we will continue our effort to decolonize these classes. Uh, that will change with what we teach. And we may also see new programs, colleges, and even new schools arise. Imagine an entire campus just devoted to the, to the climate emergency. How we teach our pedagogies, I think, are likely to change in some interesting ways, especially to the extent that we teach the crisis. Uh, for example, project-based learning and inquiry-based learning are very powerful pedagogies we know, but they're especially well-suited to the kind of complex problems of climate change. We may also see more simulations in gaming being used to teach uh, the climate crisis because we know, well, we have to deal with simulations and doing research. We're trying to model out what will happen uh, if the transatlantic conveyor stops? What does that do to temperatures in Britain, for example? We, we know about this based on a lot of data being crunched in simulations. So do we teach that way as well? Do we teach students to run simulations, to create simulations, to critically reflect on them? The same with games. And perhaps, perhaps we'll shift our way that we grade and assess students. And one argument that's out there that you've probably all heard is that the climate change is caused in part or worsened in part because of Western individualism, uh, that we are too isolated, too individualistic, too focused on our individual needs and greed and demands. And only if we thought more collectively, more collaboratively, might we advance. Well, if that argument takes hold, perhaps a way of reflecting that in the classroom is to have more group work and to have perhaps more group creating. Uh, so to really make the experience of higher education, that's one that's more collective. And on top of this, you think about the populations who enter our classes, we have all kinds of changes. And I was just talking a few minutes ago about how um, Professor Cherney's class was so geographically diverse. And some of them came from areas that are badly hit by the climate crisis already. There's one student from Miami, one student from Pakistan one student from New York. So what happens when your students are climate refugees? What happens when a student has gone through traumatic experience of a storm or a fire or a flood or the destruction of their town? How do we teach them? How do we support them? And what kind of generational gaps do we experience? 
uh, I this sign haunts me. I, I look at this every few weeks. You know, you'll die of old age, we'll die of climate change. What happens when a generation that's 18, 20 or so um, is enraged by this? They see cataclysm and their elders not doing enough about it. What kind of changes do they demand? Do they do sit-ins in the cafeteria to end beef eating? Do they demand firing or hiring certain faculty? Do they try to change the physical plant of the campus? And we should expect a lot more of this. And on top of that, our campus is existing communities. Uh, I'm fortunate to know Gambier's mayor, by the way. He's a lot of fun. Um, we're very fortunate to have him there. And think about how many how many campuses are located in cities or in countryside uh, that have to deal with municipalities as well as local government. So community relations become very interesting. Uh, for example, does a campus work with a local mitigation effort? So I mentioned before a town putting bits on seawall. Does a campus partner with it? Uh, if a town starts, for example, building out more and more uh, electrical power um, support and generation, does a campus join that? What happens when there are climate migrants? I mentioned this uh, a little bit before, but as the climate crisis worsens, we'll have people who will simply leave uh, and decide not to live in places in danger. So you think about equatorial Africa, for example, I mentioned the shores of Bangladesh and India. You think about parts of the American Southeast, uh, parts of North and South America. Uh, these populations will hit the road and try and find a better place to live. What should we try to support them on site? Should we offer to house them? Should we offer to teach them? And what does that do to town-gown relations? Do we try to do positive economic development? Uh, you know, helping build out electrical car depots, for example, with our community. And how do, does our sense of climate justice intersect with what our towns think is climate justice? Oops, excuse me for a second. Uh, thinking about as well the policies that are imposed by a city, by a county, uh, by a borough, or by a province or a state, uh, and to what extent those impact us. Imagine, for example, if uh, the state of Ohio um, decides that climate change is a myth and will forbid the construction of solar panels and wind turbines. It's not crazy to imagine this at all. Uh, how does that impact the campus? Does a campus obey or fight? Uh, what happens when you have the opposite? Um, imagine, say, a campus that is ordered uh, to put more and more low head hydro machines into its river and spoil a lovely effect. Um, plus, we have all the effects of climate change on politics. Uh, as climate gets worse, do we get emergency management uh, led by a local uh, county or city? How does that change what we do on campuses? And their econ the economic changes of this are potentially enormous. Uh, so right now, of course, you know, property values on the Florida coast are really sky high. Uh, this is where Jeffrey Epstein lived, for example. At some point, that'll turn uh, when properties are literally as well as figuratively underwater. Uh, and what happens when those are no longer artificially propped up by federally backed insurance? Uh, what happens to property values in and around deserts or the Midwest around prairies? Uh, do we get our property values spiking up as a desired place to hide out from the change? Or do they drop uh, as they're seen as too, too much in danger? Um, what does that do to our insurance, to our taxes, and so on? Um, not to mention, how do, gov how do governments tax us? Uh, do they decide, for example, to impose a fine on uh, any institution that allows too much in the way of fossil fuel driving cars? Or do they do the reverse, uh, offering tax incentives? Now, all that is pretty local. If we open our gaze a little further out and look at what academia does in the whole world, we have a lot of possibilities. And you can see the slide is covered with question marks. For example, America invented the idea of public intellectuals. These are academics who are to speak and act in the world. And we did that because we think less of our academics than almost any other country. Um, but do we support that? You know, do you support a professor like Michael Mann, who's already been doxxed and attacked in print uh, and online? Uh, do we support a faculty member like him uh, as he tries to intervene in the global debate? You know, again, think about all these different disciplines, the sociologists, the economists, the hydrologists, the chemists, who can try to influence the state government or public attitudes. How does a campus support them, especially as the crisis gets worse and worse? Do we also try to protect and preserve uh, disciplines in the crisis? Um, and how do we get to preserve them? What do we, how do we make a case for that? Do we also try to lead mitigation efforts? I mean, 
this is possibly the gravest crisis to confront the human race. Should we play a more active role? I mean, for example, should we lobby state legislatures and get more political? Should we invest endowments in physical plants? Should we collaborate with each other globally to form a, a global academic climate cadre whose goal is to try to mitigate the crisis? And when we have migrants, do we also support them with online teaching? Uh, when we had the first spate of, of migrants come out of Syria and Libya, there, a, a couple of the MOOC providers supported them with teaching them classes for free. And they caught some flack saying, ah, oh, migrants don't need this, they have more impressing needs, but this might be something that's really, really powerful. Imagine te teaching a language or a national culture to someone who's moving there for the first time. Imagine teaching skills uh, that people can use for jobs or reskilling. Uh, we have potentially a huge role to play, potentially. And at the same time, the world will change. Again, you know, you think about how rapidly the world's ideas can change and how they can influence us. Think, for example, if we rethink economics, and right now we're living in a system that's called neoliberal, which is you know, a mixed environment, state supported and free market with a stronger emphasis on the market. And people hold this responsible. I mean, you can say, oh, what caused the climate crisis? Capitalism comes the reply, right? Well, if, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong. If that's the way we think, people are right now airing a lot of alternatives. For example, the no growth economy, where we stop committing to GDP increases and we stop in order to draw less fossil fuel, burn less in the way of fossil fuels. Do we do that? And if so, how does that impact higher rent? What does it do to our endowments? What does it do to how we plan out buildings and salaries? What if we go for the circular economy idea where we strongly emphasize recycling and moving goods around, uh, physical goods around in our environment? What if we go for the donut economy, which is a kind of new deal on steroids, an effort to really radically restructure how we divide up uh, economic goods? All of these impact higher ed. And they can impact us passively, or we can also speak out as public intellectuals or as researchers and, of course, teach them. Uh, what happens in areas where there is emergency rule, that is a place which is in danger of flooding or in danger of being burned alive, and you have an emergency power? Um, how does a campus respond to that? In fact, how big does that emergency power get? Uh, what happens when you have a multinational domain uh, that tries to work on, say, the northern half of Africa or the southeast part of the United States. Um, we have to respond to that. Um, what do our political scientists people think? What do our law professors think? Uh, there's the, again the idea of decolonization politics too. Uh, if the world becomes more absorbed with that and more committed to decolonizing, um, how does that, for example, do we shift more and more economic power away from the developed world and towards the developing world? Uh, what does this do to our nature uh, and how we work? And do we help drive that? And geoengineering is one of the gravest decisions that humanity can make right now. Do we, for example, deploy um, in orbit uh, a series of mirrors and reflective surfaces in order to reduce the amount of light coming to the Earth? Do we float aerosol into the atmosphere or iron into the sea in order to change those? There are lots and lots of issues around those. Uh, I'm happy to talk about them, but does academia play a role? Uh, already, Harvard played a role in a major geoengineering project, which was shut down. Um, should we also do the opposite? Uh, should academics play a role in trying to oppose geoengineering for all of its dangers? We'll probably see both. And again, doing all this with an eye towards justice, because we know that marginalized populations around the world traditionally and so far are continuing to be the most su they suffer disproportionately from the impacts of the climate crisis. Um, and you know, in the United States, think about populations that are black and Hispanic, uh, think about around the world populations that are minoritized by the religion. And we know worldwide that women bear a higher burden than men on the climate crisis. How do we rethink higher education in that view? To what extent do we become advocates for climate justice and how do we implement that in our institutions and in our professions.
you know, just two books to point out, for example, uh, a whole other idea, the idea that we should recover indigenous ways of knowledge and support indigenous populations around the world. Uh, Braiding Sweetgrass is a beautiful and powerful book by a scientist who manages to describe her work in upstate New York by, forgive the pun, it's a pun that's in the book, braiding together her scientific and our Native American ways of knowledge, of knowing and thinking. Uh, Amitabh Ghosh's new book, Nutmeg's Curse, is a passionate call for us to return to a kind of animism, to give life, to give authority, to give agency to non-human actors, everything from geology to weather to animals. I mean, if we do this, how does that change higher education? To what extent does our campus become something that's more alive? To what extent do we re-engage with the indigenous past, which is so crucial for so many campuses? Um, how does this impact our research and the curricula that we offer? So let me just let me just try to wrap this up. This, this presentation itself is becoming a hyper object, but let me just try to point in some future directions where things might go. I mean, we have had some early signals about how we might approach the climate crisis from the COVID crisis. Uh, COVID, in its third year now, gave us, among other things, a glimpse of what it's like to deliberately cut back CO2 emissions. We know we have that power, and we literally know what it looks like. Uh, it may be a kind of dry run for climate change. You know, you think about a global catastrophe, one that's very complicated, that involves everybody in many, many ways. Is that what have we learned from this? We may have learned, for example, that we organize internationally very poorly, uh, that we have politicized science all up and down the block, uh, and we know that we also have a tremendous amount of ingenuity. Um, and we also know that we can connect social justice to the crisis. We've also known in, ac in academia that we split on one particular issue, internationalization of higher ed. Uh, on the one hand, COVID has increased our internationalization and in that we've done more and more research to try and work together and campuses have felt lack of international students more and more painfully. But at the same time, this has also thrown a lot of campuses back to their localities to try to be as local, as national as possible. We've seen this in India, we've seen this in Turkey, we've seen this in Brazil and the Philippines. I think looking ahead at academia, we have to rethink and redesign our enterprise. What we do with research, what we do with teaching, our community relations, how we are on the world stage, we have to and we will rethink, redesign, operate all of these measures. We could also sit it out. Um, there are a lot of arguments actually for doing just that. Um, we've had uh, arguments that say, for example, that uh, we don't have, as academics, we have a lot on our plates uh, and we should reserve our energies for efforts that get more bang per buck. So instead of trying to decarbonize our campus, we should fight to decarbonize, say, a Ford Motor. Uh, instead of trying to add more solar panels to our individual campuses, we should fight for the state to incentivize people to have more solar. Uh, maybe academics are too overburdened. I mean, people are worried about tenure, they're worried about departmental transformation, they're worried about jobs, they're worried about their uh, sustainability financially. A lot of academics just don't have time for this. There are a lot of crises out there. And we also believe to some extent, and it varies from campus to campus, that we have a measure of autonomy, uh, that we don't have to follow politics, that the ivory tower exists for a reason, that we can stand apart the fray. And perhaps that's something that we should do here. We shouldn't be hasty. Um, at the same time, there's also the fear that anti-academic forces can use the climate change to hurt us. So, for example, uh, you could see a bunch of Trump supporters saying, yes, academics should fly less um, because they just want to jab at higher education, which they tend to dislike. So these are all reasons you'll see others uh, for not getting involved. I think in many ways we have to plan and we have to plan strategically not just tactically. We have to think about this for the short term, so you know, a semester, a year, but also for the very long term. You know, what happens to Gambier in 40 or 80 years? Uh, and we have to do this in a just way, in a democratic lowercase d way, where we involve everybody. I'm delighted there's students involved in this conversation right now, and I want to hear from them. We should invite students into our councils as we co-create the new future of higher education because we have to rethink the whole thing. Now, 
it's possible our campuses will look like a solar punk future. Solar punk is a design school that tries to imagine an optimistic future. And it may be that we look like this, even in cities, that we are greener, we are wetter, we are more lush, more multicultural. I want to conclude by making our uh, librarian happy by explaining why I call this universities on fire. One reason is to emphasize the danger that we're in, literal fire in some cases, but the danger of our, our communities, our institutions being chewed up, gnawed at, destroyed or harmed. A second reason is I think of an intellectual fire, a political fire, that our campuses will be mobilized, energized, exercised, willing to do new things, to think new thoughts, to become more active, that we will see squabbles, arguments, divisions, revolutions, reform across our institutions and as they, as they engage with the rest of the world. So that's a kind of temporal fire. But there's also a third way. Symbolically, we associate fire with destruction, but we also associate it with warmth and with illumination. Symbolically, it often lights the way to new insights. What I hope to do with this research, with this book and more to come, is to provoke academics and academically adjacent folks to think hard about this crisis and to plan and to imagine and to envision new futures. And then hopefully, hopefully all of that thinking, acting and envisioning will give us both warmth and illumination. I wanna stop here. I've been going on for a long time, and I want to stop and give you all a chance to give us your thoughts, your questions, and your ideas. Um, let me know if there's a point you want me to go back to to focus on, um, or if you want to talk about Kenyon College and the liberal arts world, or if there's a, something that I missed, I uh, didn't pay enough attention to, um, or if you want to talk about what this means for your life and your profession. Uh, podium is yours. Uh, Jenna uh, Nolt, that's a beautiful point. Thank you. Some seeds need fire to grow. It's quite true. Uh, I'm blanking on the word. It's pyro, it's pyrogenetic. Is that right? Um, pyro germination, maybe? I think so. Brian, I don't want you to go too quickly, uh, scan past that last uh, slide of yours where people can continue the conversation with you uh, after this event. And of course, I don't say that to foreclose questions. I want to make sure that we've got time for questions. Um, but I noticed that tomorrow's Future Trend Forum is actually on the concept of eco-media literacy. Uh -huh. um, so it sounds like there, there are opportunities through the Future Trends Forum to discuss these issues regularly. It is a wonderful, participatory, interesting, active online meeting that is well worth folks' time. Um, Thank you, so I wanted to make sure that uh, folks know how the conversation continues, how we can, uh... at the end, I found myself thinking Gondor calls for aid, the beacons are lit. Um, so nice. Uh, nice. more opportunities. Well, just to explain the, my, there's my Twitter link, uh, of course, because I'm on Twitter. I've been tweeted for about an hour now and I'm already getting the jitters, but the, um, but the, the top link is uh, a kind of home base for all of my different projects. Um, uh, future education at US, it'll take you to the future transform and to my blog. Uh, right now in, uh, in all, in all candor, uh, what I'm, uh, going to be doing over the next year is publishing articles. I've got a couple in the pipeline right now. I'm going to be launching a series of podcasts specifically on universities on fire. Uh, we'll be having more people hosted on the future trans forum, uh, and more stuff to come, uh, because I'm, I'm passionate about this and I want to hear, I want to get as many people thinking about this as possible. Um, and Ron, thank you. I told you I'll get to that metaphor. So what do you think? What questions do you have here? And you know, if you, if you don't ask, I'm going to call on you all. I am really uh, fascinated, Brian, by the two sides of colleges dealing with climate refugees, which I think I think we dealt with the first one in some ways in terms of COVID refugees, 
that you know Kenyon has had its own experience of trying to support students who were dislocated through COVID, who were traumatized in COVID. I think mm -hmm. we've done some things very well. I think we've done some things average, and I think it's fair to criticize some of the things we've done. Um, but uh, I think that's one level, and that's that's the level I usually go to. You know, when after Hurricane Katrina and Rita, I know that Kenyon admitted a single digit number of students who'd been at Tulane or one of the other New Orleans universities. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't quite wrap my head around some of the questions of a broader scale of climate refugee. And you know, what would Kenyan's responsibility be to displaced Floridians or Egyptians? And that's, I, I don't even know what the, what the mental, what the, what the analog would be. So that's kind of what I'm asking is, is are there other cases where colleges have responded to that kind of enormous yeah. dislocation? Let me just quickly uh, put in a plug here um, for uh, a wonderful book. Um, Disasterology is um, uh, the best single book on disaster planning that I've ever seen. Um, and the uh, author uh, not only shows you how to do disaster planning, but it's, uh, it's her autobiography of working in Hurricane Katrina, working in Hurricane Sandy, and working in others. It's funny. Uh, it's really smart. And it's uh, it just, I, I recommend it. It's, a, it's a hard to stop reading. Um, well, I, I mentioned the the uh, the whole hyperobject problem, and and this is this is an issue actually where people grope for historical precedents uh, for this, and we haven't really found one. I mean, the optimistic one is World War II, but it doesn't quite work. So this isn't exactly a war, um, but uh, and there's also the bad precedent that the tiny handful of refugees from Libya and uh, Afghanistan and from Syria from the US interventions there, um, those alone belted European politics to the right. Um, and they hit US politics as well. And those were that's a tiny population. Uh, they freaked us the heck out. Um, and if we're looking at a crisis that is likely to present hundreds of thousands and then millions of refugees, um, you know, the, the precedents people reach for are things like the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, because we we don't have a lot of recent examples at, at this scale, um, so it's it's right now in terms of academic responses. I've seen a few. Uh, some Australian universities were putting up firefighters uh, during the terrible firestorms that racked that nation. Uh, we've seen individual campuses, including religious ones and private ones, uh, that have hosted small groups of population um, in the summertime. Uh, I've seen some California institutions host more people and feed people for a short period of time, like two or three days, um, because that was they had the capacity at that point. Um, but right now, we 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 don't have much of a, of a precedent for this. Um, so it's a it's a really really good point to bring up, um, and I think the refugee crisis is one that the Pentagon is terrified of this. Nobody else is really talking about it. Uh, because this threatens to just, you know, really upend a lot of politics. Uh, whoever CIP workroom is, hello, CIP workroom, um, asks, do you see the change over in our energy economy as necessarily binary from almost exclusively fossil fuel based to almost exclusively renewable? Is there room for fossil fuels in the future at all, in your opinion? Uh, most people see this as binary, um, that the, the switch is going to be pretty total. Uh, not tomorrow, but that we basically don't have a choice. Uh, if you talk to uh, 350.org, they say we just have to stop taking oil out of the ground. We've got to write all that off and stop uh, because every barrel that we burn is pushing the, the temp temperature up. Um, now, uh, there's a big push coming right now. This is pretty um, technical, but for using uh, pre-existing petroleum reserves for plastics, so plastics are very heavily drawn upon petroleum. Uh, so it may be that you see companies like you know, Exxon switch from being fuel providers to being plastic sources. So that might be um, uh, the way that goes. But overall, yeah, the, the, the idea is for us to be switched completely off of that. Uh, you could think there are good precedents of that in the past too. You could think, for example, about how ships went from sale to coal to oil. Um, good question.
Bonnie Nygaard asks, uh, oh, by the way, if anyone else wants to chime in on this topic, I'm glad to share the mic. Uh, Bonnie Nygaard asks, are there measures in place to minimize the nutrient and waste that we've released into the ocean? Um, so far, that's a disaster. Uh, and we're, we're doing very little about it. Um, and it's possible that the transition, uh, transitioning the energy basis of our civilization will lead to more waste uh, and more uh, more horror is pumped into the ocean. Um, acidification for that really, really frightens me. That's one of the great, great disasters looming ahead. Um, if we start to really acidify the oceans, then that just knocks down the amount, among other things, the amount of food we can draw from fish. Um, and that that would be a, a spectacle of, of horror. Um, so we need to watch this very carefully, Bonnie. Both Bonnie and, and, and CIP Workroom, if you'd like to jump in and talk about these particular topics, um, please uh, feel free. I don't know. I saw that there were um, measures being in place to stop CSOs, combined sewage overflows in some yeah. cities. Yeah. And I think that the conversation around waste has started to pop, or, like, pop up and become a political issue. Mm -hmm. But I, I still, I can't, I can't even believe that we're having this conversation now when waste has always been a part of our societies and yeah. once everything is flooded and mm -hmm. it's just it's so overwhelming yeah <laughs> well I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned this uh, are you a student yes um i i used to work with oysters in the new york harbor for the billion oyster project oh so yeah really big yeah, yeah. No. Uh, what do you study here? I am an environmental studies major. Oh, fantastic, Bonnie. Oh, I, I would love to hear more from you on this. You um, uh, saw my contact info. I, I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, the um, uh, Well, waste is something that we, you know, famously don't want to think about. Um, and you can see this in some interesting ways socially. Uh, for example, the Indian caste system, uh, the untouchables were that way in part because they handled a lot of waste, especially animal and human waste. Um, you could look at uh, uh, Japan, uh, where marginalized populations were traditionally assigned waste issues. That's where the uh, uh, Yakuza come from, in part, uh, from the 19th century. Uh, and in New York, of course, notoriously and famously, you have a lot of organized crime involved in waste. Um, so, uh, and, and this gets worse than it sounds because when we have disasters that strike our waste facilities, they crack the waste into everything else. So when you have flooding of sewers, that's a terrible, terrible thing. Um, I mean, the results are awful. Um, and I, I, when I was calling this a hyper object, you think waste is a major problem. It's just one part of it. Um, but yeah, we have to think about this. Is there anything going on in campus about this? Do you guys have a, a major recycling initiative, for example? Do you do uh, e-waste and 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 uh, composting? We don't have a compost system in place, but there is recycling. Um, I don't I don't know if the farm we have a, a Kenyan farm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're they have a compost system, but that would be a very very small system. Um, but it's definitely something that we could start on campus. It's just that I don't think it's there's been a conversation around it yet. Oh, cool. There's something to do, something that would be really practical and tangible. Thank you, Bonnie, for mentioning this. Um, Cyrus Griffin. Hello, Cyrus, again. Uh, says, are there, in my opinion, any significant threats to a global effort against climate change that universities can and should address in particular? Cyrus, right now, there are so many. Um, but at the same time, you know, this hyper object, right? But also higher education is that diverse. Right? If you look in the US, we have about 4,000 colleges and universities uh, and they have a lot, relatively speaking, of autonomy. Um, so Kenyan College can focus on one thing, Ohio State can focus on another thing. Uh, you know, College of Wooster can do something else. DePaul can do something else. Um, and there's, there's, so we have a lot of pieces, and it may be the individual campuses, individual programs pick one particular piece. So Bonnie was talking about the Oyster Project in New York. So it may be that you, know, you get a school like NYU or Columbia or one of the CUNY campuses that really focuses on that. Uh, I think right now it's uh, it, it's hard to measure the uh, relative threats because 
they're all so dangerous <laughs> and, and and they're all so bad. And in part, it may depend on where you are geographically. Um, so for uh, Ohio is less worried about sea level rise, for example, although there's some interesting stuff about the Great Lakes. Um, but for you all thinking about the prairie, uh, thinking about water supplies might be more urgent, whereas uh, a campus in southern uh, Texas would be much more worried about desertification and about uh, seaborne storms. Um, so I, I hate to say all the above, Cyrus, but it really is all the above. Uh, Sarah Haidt, Sarah, I hope I pronounced that correctly. My German is just absolutely terrible. Um, uh, says, I've wondered for a long time about how to think about the centrality of computing and electronics and electronic devices in contemporary academic work. For instance, I've seen faculties aiming towards being paper free in their assessments and grading for taking and responding to all assignments electronically. But I wonder whether that all just hides the environmental impact of using electronic devices all the time. Do you have thoughts about this? Do you consider it in your new book? Yes and yes. Um, so it kind of splits right now. Uh, the arguments go through a bunch of different angles. Um, there's a dematerializing angle that um, if uh, Joe wants to come into my campus to visit my class, that uh, if he just fires up Zoom, that just generates less carbon than him getting on a plane and ending up at Dulles and then driving from Dulles to Georgetown. Um, and that's true, straight up. Unless you take a look at the full life cycle of the computers that uh, that we're using and the hardware to supply them and you know the screens and the mics and the speakers and you think about the electricity behind it you think about the e-waste pro problem that happens to these afterwards and then you list the second side of this which calls for green computing and the idea that we should use less intensive computing for example you think about the most extreme example is bitcoin mining uh, which uses a ton of electricity uh, and it may be the biggest thing, the biggest challenge to Bitcoin, setting aside scams, rampant piracy, uh, rampant criminality, a terrible design, setting aside all of that may just be that it's it's terrible for the climate. Um, so you know, look, you look down the road a bit and there's some interesting arguments saying that perhaps instead we should have a more material pedagogy, not just using the paper free system, but using more paper. Uh, that we should uh, de-emphasize computing. And both of these models are out there. And I and both of these can cite scholarly sources, estimates. There's a lot of frantic research on this being done right now. Um, it's it's definitely uh, a major area. So I, I'd love to hear more from you. Um, how do you think about this? Oh, Ron, you actually raised your hand. Crikey. Yeah. You can see then. Yeah, I just I, I just wanted to give some information about Kenyan's specific situation. Um, uh, for example, most of our most of the online vendors, most of the technology vendors online now are working very hard. Many of them are have been carbon neutral for a number of years, at least as far as their energy consumption. So, in fact, one of the issues right now in a sort of a, a short term basis is shouldn't we move our computing into the cloud, which is carbon neutral? which is using electricity, not necessarily generated by coal, the electricity that we use on our campus in Ohio is in fact, mostly generated by coal. So moving, you know, local systems are worse for the environment than uh, those in the cloud. Um, we also work really, we, we have a 100% green recycling issue. But I think one of the things that, um, you know, you, and I'm sure you're aware of this, Brian, that there's a movement um, to require the ability to repair, to do local repairs for equipment. Many vendors like Apple in particular, but mm -hmm. other vendors um, mm -hmm. don't do that. They do not, they don't permit you to repair your own equipment. They you violate all kinds of sort of uh, warranties and other things. And yeah. that's caused a huge impact on the climate because you're either shipping stuff back and paying a lot of money to get things to be repaired or you're abandoning it and moving on to buying the next thing, and you're getting into that 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 uh, upgrade cycle that is so that's so impactful. So so one of the things that I worry about with regard to technology is that is the upgrade cycle. Um, even if we can make our technology relatively green in terms of its uh, sort of direct energy impact, these are these are great points. And I want to just grab onto these a bit. Uh, the, the first is, like, it depends on how you structure the digital world. 
Um, and so, you know, you think about, for example, uh, right now in Kazakhstan, uh, a bunch of Bitcoin miners left China because China had more or less banned Bitcoin mining and headed to Kazakhstan, which is about 70% coal burning. Um, so you get the worst CO2 combined with the worst computer usage. Um, and you wonder about uh, you know, just how bad that is. And again, just if, if I can make this a little more, more challenging, we're thinking about this right now in 2022. I'm thinking of how upset Bonnie was. Let's take that upset and let's heighten it. If we believe that in 50 years, unchecked climate change will result in the deaths of millions, isn't it our responsibility in 2022 to do absolutely every freaking thing we can to prevent that? And that connection is not one that a lot of people make. Uh, but if that is what's going to happen, if we decide to you know, burn more coal and burn more oil, burn more gas, then we have to stop it. And it's a literally life or death situation. So then you think about the, the power centers and the, and the data centers that rely on water or wind or solar. And you think, okay, do we have an ethical, a climate ethical approach to cloud computing? Uh, again, that's an interdisciplinary thinking right there. Uh, and your second point about recycling, this is great. Uh, it, somebody meant, uh, or about materials recycling, excuse me. Um, vendors are really keen to do this. Uh, we can't always trust that they do what they say, but it's something that is worth uh, watching carefully. Um, there was another point uh, on that line. Yeah, Orchid mentioned that she uh, researches and teaches classes on waste and literature, which is really important. And Joe added that he thought there was composting in the dining hall. Um, so that's something to check out. Um, oh, this is great. Um, then Orchid weighs in um, with the future feeling so restrictive and challenging in terms of possible scenarios. I wonder what the responsibility of the university has to foster spaces of pleasure and empathy outside of transactional solutions for communities. Uh, that's a fantastic question. Um, that's a really powerful question. How do we feel joy in this? Uh, I think the solar punk design and fiction move one way. Um, you could think about fiction like uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mystery for the Future. Um, and as I told you, Class Orchid, I think we need to figure out a way to, to make this not just a, avoid a negative, but achieve a positive um, so that this is something which is because they tell you to, because you want to be uh, this kind of green. Uh, I think campuses, we could do it badly. We could erect the ivory tower walls and become wonderful places of delight and pleasure uh, while the world burns. Um, but I think we have to figure out a way to have that pleasure and delight and learning and teaching and discovery while also making sure that we have all these other measures being engaged with. We're a tall order. Or could you're, you're typing. Do you want, you want to grab the mic or do you want to type more? Either way. Oh, no. Just as you're, when you're mentioning solar punk, I just put into the chat the a link to Hope oh. Punk as well, because I'm very interested in sort of thinking about, and I'm so, I'm so glad that you mentioned sort of indigenous knowledge systems as sort of like also a ways of sort of like dis, almost like distangling ourselves from this linear determinism of climate change, which I often worry about. You know, it's very restrictive in terms of our imagination. And how can we imagine differently, different scenarios? And I think Indigenous scholars and, and scientists are, are very much doing that. They're incorporating uh, traditional um, ecological knowledge in, in ways that I think will be um, um, offer fruitful adaptations to the kinds of crises that we're facing. Well, that's a great point. Uh, braiding sweetgrass, for example, is uh, absolutely delightful. It's also shot through with mourning, M-O-U-R-N, and, and loss. But again and again, she delights in discovering uh, either uh, bits of knowledge, how she learns to do things, but also just the pleasures of working with the earth in a way that is much more positive. Um, yeah, it's a, thank you. And thank you for mentioning Hope Punk, uh, which is hard to say, um, but, but thank you. Um, Sarah, let me see, I, I want to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Um, uh, Sarah Height, uh, also from Lit, from Lit World, says, I also worry that we inadvertently train all of our students and ourselves to feel as though all serious work happens through computers. The computers and computer work are inevitable, just a constant condition of modern life. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know if we're training that, Sarah, or if we're just confirming that. Um, I mean, it, it seems it seems pretty uh, pretty widespread. Sorry, one of my cats was just scaling me. Um, uh, and right now, that seems that it's something which is um, pretty thoroughly established. I mean, you think, for example, about uh, what COVID did, how we responded to COVID by being online. Uh, it's fascinating to think about what would have happened if we had this pandemic at the scale in, say, 1982. Um, um, plus, we have so many services that are delivered electronically. I mean, you think about health services, you know, government services. Um, it's it's really just, a, um, I, I think higher ed is part of this. Um, but also, you know, there, there are there are the opposites. You know, you think about people who are really interested in handcrafts, um, people who are really interested. The, the cliche of the hipster interested in vinyl records is true. That happens. Um, so it may be that, uh, you know, you look up to the uh, Middlebury link that Joe shared earlier. Um, there's a very skeptical um, strain. I don't think that strain is new. I think it's long running. But but yeah, that's uh, something to think of. Uh, Ron adds that he worries it'll become a truth that reading a computer is more ethical than reading a paper book. Uh, I don't know how to unpack that for the library. Well, if you've got the books, you're fine. I mean, it's it's a question of building up your collection. Um, but then we, but imagine thinking this through for the library, right? The right library services are wondering about this, like, you know, so is print on demand better than having people ship you hardcover and paperback books? Um, what do you think about book jackets? Um, you know, adding the wonderful acetate or mylar covers to them to protect them or just dispensing with them completely. Uh, which of them is better uh, in terms of CO2 emissions? Um, I mean, in a sense, rethinking our carbon footprint is a very, very radical project. Uh, which really goes into all kinds of things. Um, I'm saying this in front of you know some of my books. Right? Uh, Cyrus comes back and adds it with the ability that academic institutions have to operate transnationally without having to worry about international relations in the same way that governments do. What do you think about the potential for universities to connect and create community overseas and across borders? I think the potential is immense, Cyrus. Um, uh, I think we have a huge, huge capacity to do work. Um, my good friend Trent Batson thinks that if we were to take, say, 100 students uh, from every campus in the world, um, then you have something uh, enormous. Then you have something like nearly a million people. Um, imagine what that group could do uh, to improve the world. Um, you think about the ways that our research, you know, there's nothing really national about a lot of research. You know, if you're looking at French poetry, you don't have to be in France. If you're researching uh, chemical interactions, you can be anywhere on Earth. I mean, I mean, the mind is global in this sense in many, many ways. So we can really do a lot to have this kind of community relation. Um, and we've already done this in some ways. You think about study abroad, for example, or about digital twins. Um, I think we can do a lot. I think we have a lot of potential for this if we do it right. Um, the past two years, the pandemic showed that we try not to do this, uh, which really concerns me. Um, Sarah, no problem, no problem. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm happy to read you um, and, to, and to hear your thoughts that way. Um, I'm just worried that, my, that a cat butt is going to show up right now and just like project right at the camera. So um, I'll, I'll try and black things out if that happens. And you're so tremendously generous with your time. And I, I know that uh, it is rewarding for everyone. I do want to point out it's after 5.30. You have spent so very much time with us. So while we could certainly take another question or two, but I do want to be respectful of people's evening and such like. Thank you. That's very, that's very good of you to say. I, I'd be happy to take another question or two if there are some. Um, and um, um, Matt, I understand. I understand. Um, this is a subject that is so deep um, that you know, once you get into it, it's, it's kind of hard to climb out. If I could ask you all just a quick question. Uh, I touched on this in, in my remarks, but I, I don't want to I, I want to hear more from you all on this. What do you see as the particular approach of the liberal arts college to the climate crisis? Is it our, our, our love of student faculty research combined? Um, do you think it's it's our close attention to students so that we may see students driving more and more of our operations? Um, 
is it the way we we try to blend our research and teaching very deeply? What do you think? What's the single, small liberal arts college uh, unique take on all this? My suspicion for this small liberal arts college is that there are there is a lot of work going on around um, the community engaged communication aspect mm. and and the question of how we can make sure that we are producing uh, people who know how to communicate for society for multiple societies. Mm might mm. be the way that I would want to say it. People who can write a good academic research paper and can also write an effective letter to the editor um, or as you heard today, podcast episode um, or, and, and we've got a lot happening in that area that I think, um, I think fits with who and where we are very effectively. I, I put a quote in there from Roosevelt Montas, the scholar, uh, Sip Brown, I think about what a liberal education is, and it does deal with existential questions. And I think this is an existential question. So that is why a liberal arts education and a liberal arts institution is naturally suited to dealing with this big of a question. Mm. Oh. It's my favorite quote of the week. I just wanted to, sh I'm sharing it with everybody in every forum. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'm going to grab this. Um, this is his essay on uh, on uh, great books, I think. Yeah, he wrote the book about. He wrote a book on it, and then he's written a couple oh. of essays associated with that. And this right. may have come from one of his essays, but I don't know if he's quoting himself on the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah those, that's that's caused a bit of a storm. Yeah. Um, now that's lovely. Uh, that puts us right smack in the middle of it. Um, uh, Sarah Height uh, thinks that we're small enough and generalist oriented enough that we could, if we try to do it, model ways to approach complicated and difficult questions collaboratively from multiple disciplinary approaches, the sciences, the humanities, the social sciences, and fine arts. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's harder for a research one university to do. Um, it's harder for a community college to do. Um, but yeah, this is something which you can pivot on. Um, you know, I mean, think about just, you know, the, the generality of this conversation that we've had so far, how many domains it's crossed. Um, yeah, that really can work. Um, Bonnie uh, Nygaard says, um, I think Kenyon is very connected to its students. That creates an amazing environment that listens to our concerns and help us deal with what's next. You know, Bonnie, it may be that liberal arts colleges across the U.S. are kind of the first signals of what 18 to 22 year olds are going to be thinking um, because other schools don't listen quite as carefully. Um, this is the fine antenna um, that tell us what's going on and hearing uh, what you guys would like to do. Um, maybe schools like Kenyon are our first glimpse of that future generation right there. Um, Kenyon CIP, that guy, uh, it says, I think we have a kind of campus discussion, which is not what happens at 10 or 20 times our size. Yeah. Yeah. If you're 20,000 students, it's a very, very different involvement. Um, Judy uh, Holdener says, the professors can bring these challenges into their classrooms as objects of study. Students with a different perspectives from different disciplines. Uh, she relied her calculus course to bring in climate change. Judy, that's awesome. I would love to hear about that. Um, Roland, great to see you. I understand you have to go. Gee, seriously, I, I'm going to put my email address here. I mean, my webpage also did, you know, has a contact, but this should be able to tell you how to find me. Um, Judy, I, I would love to hear about how you did that. Um, and uh, Bonnie, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts. And uh, all of you, all of you, um, I'd love to hear more. Um, so please, please stay in touch. Um, Joe, thank you for being a great host and an MC. Um, I get the feeling that people are beginning to drop like flies. I should probably let, let them all go. It is. We, we made a good choice. Uh, you know, we, we didn't host you in person because we were worried about uh, the virus. As it happens, we are actually now worried about the ice storm. 
So in some ways, <laughs> as well as being climate uh, uh, better for carbon emissions, uh, yeah. you're probably yeah. more likely to sleep in your own bed tonight. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate that. I have, I have many memories of ice storms. So, um, so that means for all of you, please be safe. Take care. Drive carefully. Um, and uh, you know, walk on the snow instead of the ice when you can. Um, and, uh, and stay nice and warm. Bonnie, uh, Sarah, Orchid, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate your kind words. Thank you um, so much, Brian. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. And uh, thanks, everyone.